thanks for having me. It's good to see uh, some familiar faces again. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the role of radiation in uh, pleural mesothelioma and go through some of the scenarios we see in the clinic. So the scenarios that, um, or now some, of you who are some of you who are following the slides in the loose leaf, I've remo removed a few slides just to help, help keep the program going. So typically, um, I, t I try to be very simplistic. Uh, I divide things into the three scenarios that I typically see. Uh, one is patients after a pneumonectomy or an extra pleural pneumonectomy. It's kind of the situation Dr. Flores was just talking about, uh, where I'd say it's, it's been pretty established the past 15 years with giving radiation afterwards is, is really become the standard of care. And just like Dr. Flores was talking about, that's a, clinically a little bit of an easier situation for the radiation oncologist. A lot of the cr uh, critical structures, the lung, um, are out of the radiation field, and, and we can usually deliver it fairly safely. The other two scenarios that we see are where the lung is still there, uh, where the lung is intact, and we have to work around it. And so that's a much more challenging uh, clinical scenario. And so those could be after pleurectomy, the other surgery Dr. Flores was just talking about, um, where we have to decide whether we want to give radiation or, or just observe the patient. And then the last situation is unresectable disease, so where, kind of again, what, what Dr. Flores is talking about, where it's kind of concrete in there, it's very tough to do any surgery, and those are typically the, the most difficult situations. So I just want to go through them one by one, uh, so after extrapleural pneumonectomy. So this is how uh, we typically do it at, at Sloan Kettering. Um, those of you in the room who aren't radiation oncologists, which is everyone other than myself, uh, aren't you still looking at this? This is, the, uh, uh, this is the field that we look at. This is the center of the field. And then uh, everything in this field is getting radiation unless we block it, like the shoulder here, the spinal cord, and then the liver. Um, so this is conventional radiation and, and the kind we've been doing uh, really since the early 90s, uh, late 80s uh, at Sloan and throughout, throughout the country. Severe toxicity is, is fairly rare uh, with this radiation. It's a very tiring treatment. So even if some of you in the room have gone through it, I'm not saying it's an easy treatment. It's, it's still a challenging treatment. But people usually aren't hospitalized from it. They're very tired afterwards, loss of appetite. Uh, but to, to see severe toxicity requiring hospitalization is fairly rare. And we are getting uh, good local control with this technique. Uh, there's been a lot of excitement about using a more advanced uh, means of radiation, intensely modulated radiation, uh, to improve local control. Uh, but, and it seemed to have some better local control than conventional radiation, but unfortunately there was, some, there was severe toxicity with it. Um, so here are just some institutions that were using intensely modulated radiation. I'm going to describe what IMRT means in a little bit. Uh, in Texas, I saw about 10% of people were dying uh, from the radiation. Uh, this study actually made a lot of news in the, in the medical community at uh, Harvard, where about half the patients who received the IMRT, again, died of radiation complications. Uh, so part of the uh, concern was with IMRT comes in from different angles that some of the other lung might have been getting radiation, and that was the cause of, of some of this uh, severe toxicity. Um, so there's been a lot of effort lately to try to make this a safer treatment, uh, but we're not completely there yet. So just to sum up, for, for radiation after the lung's been removed, the local control rate is still good. IMRT might be able to help us out in some situations, but we've got to figure out a way to do it safely. So just to go to the other two scenarios, and this is fairly new stuff uh, that I've been doing and some other centers have been doing, where we want to give the radiation uh, with an intact lung underneath. So kind of this, the, the way to think about this is imagine you have an apple and you want to take a BB gun and shoot off the skin, but not touch the fruit. Uh, and so it's a, real, it's a real challenge for us on, on how to do that, because uh, we have this lung underneath there that we don't want to damage with the radiation. We know it's a very sensitive organ to radiation. 
uh, but we want to get all the lining. So this is how we used to do it uh, from the 70s on through. And again, this is the radiation field, this rectangle. And then to protect the lung, we'd have to put a block under the lung and then try to give, deliver some radiation underneath that. And what we were really doing there was blocking the tumor as well from the radiation as, as well as the lung. So this really was not working very well. And, and but actually, we did it for about 30 years. Uh, not me personally, but uh, the institution. Uh, so but when, yeah, so I, I, we really needed to come up with new ways to do it. And that's where I started using intensely modulated radiation, again, to try to shoot off the skin of the apple without damaging the apple. So without getting into too much of the physics, IMRT is really a way to um, deliver portions of radiation to with, within a field of radiation. So even to go back, if this is a radiation field, you might want to deliver more radiation here, more over here, but less in the center. So we're modifying the intensity of the radiation or intensity modulated radiation therapy. I heard someone in the audience ask earlier about tomotherapy, and then if, if, if you read up there, um, you know, uh, rapid arc, um, there are all, all these different techniques out there of delivering the radiation uh, using IMRT. And they're a little bit like the difference between Coke and Pepsi. You know, obviously, if you speak to the tomotherapy people, the, the sun rises and sets on tomotherapy, and it's the greatest treatment ever. And it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent modality, but, but it's... It's really just the brand of delivering the radiation. And so different centers, you know, I would, you know if, if they have tomotherapy, that's great. If they have rapid arc, that's great too. There, there are a lot of different techniques out there, and, and one isn't necessarily better than the other. And this is really the key slide of, of this whole presentation, so we'll take a minute on this. Uh, and this is exactly what we're trying to do. Red is high doses of radiation. Blue is no radiation, so we're trying to keep the other lung free of radiation. And then yellow is low doses. And, and this is exactly what we're trying to do here, deliver a high dose to the edge of the lung where the pleura is and where the disease is. And you see there's some difference with planing there. So, And low dose in the center of the lung and almost no dose to the other lung. And this is the goal of uh, IMRT. And there's some other pictures in there uh, in, in your loose leaf of, of this. So we've uh, treated... Uh, we've treated a little bit more than this now, but we 26 patients with uh, malignant pleural mesothelioma, all with two intact lungs, so this, uh, so this is no one had a pneumonectomy. And we started this program in uh, 2005, and we use, we use PET scan for, for treatment planning as well. Uh, pushing survival further, radiation, pushing survival further, immunotherapy, you know, uh, biologic agents, all these things just to try to, you know, uh, keep people feeling good and alive for as long as possible. Uh, so everyone did the tumor eventually did come back, and that was about three months later on, on average. But again, that, that was a situation where the tumor is already back, so we are pushing it a little bit better. And here's kind of the, uh, uh, an example of, of one of the patients Dr. Krug and I treated, a 59-year-old gentleman who had long history of asbestos exposure. And uh, you could just see his one lesion there. This was diagnosed in February of 2007, so a little bit more than two years ago. Uh, so he received four cycles of standard chemotherapy, did not have a response to his tumor. Uh, so at this point in time, this tip, there's really not much therapy uh, left for this patient. You can try second-line chemotherapy. We know that's historically not been very successful. So we're talking about, unfortunately, maybe about four to six months where this patient uh, would succumb to his disease. Um, I gave him the plural IMRT at this point in, in June of 2007, so a little bit two years ago. And here he is a few months after the radiation. His tumor shrunk down. His need for narcotic pain medicine had decreased significantly. Um, He's just taking it uh, you know, once or twice a week. He had a lot less pain, and he was doing really well. And then in, uh, about four or five months after that, his tumor did recur. So it's about um, eight, nine months from the end of the radiation. And then he received second-line chemotherapy until he, he died a year ago. So unfortunately, even though it's this, this, you know, I want to give kind of a typical scenario here where um, someone's situation, we probably extended his life six to eight months. 
and it was pain-free during that time, or much less pain, so his quality of life was very high as well. And that's really where I see the pleurolyme artifa unresectable disease going, trying to uh, push the failure further into the future and keep people feeling good during that time and do it in a safe way, because obviously we have people so tired and short of breath after the radiation, they're just bed bound, then, then there's really no point in doing it. So, so that's what we're looking for here. And currently we do have a phase two trial of induction chemotherapy and pleural IMRT for uh, unresectable patients that we're enrolling on actively at, at Sloan Kettering. And just uh, uh, one slide here on some of the toxicity. And uh, if Dr. Sturman can look at this, um, hey, he's probably. This is what your normal lung should look like, and I did pick a very severe slide, and, and Dr. Sturman's glad that he doesn't work at Memorial probably right now. Uh, so this is a lot of radiation damage here. Uh, so this is one of the toxicities that we saw in a patient. Uh, but this, this, this gentleman, did he was on oxygen and steroids, uh, but he has recovered. I'm, I'm seeing him in about two weeks. I saw Dr. Krug had seen him about two, three weeks ago, and he's off the oxygen. He's actually doing fairly well, uh, was hospitalized for a few days. So, this is, so even the severe toxicities, uh, people can recover from, uh, but we do try to avoid them, obviously. And so just to conclude up here, after extra pleuronuminectomy, I think it's, it's very conventional, it's, it's very standard of care now to give radiation afterwards. I think we need to figure out some of the bugs in IMRT to prevent those severe toxicities, and we'll probably get there in the next five years. After pleurectomy, pleurectomy decortication, we can consider pleural IMRT for, for certain situations to improve the local control. For unresectable, we can consider pleural IMRT to, I really think of it as prolonging palliation. Again, just another, another tool to push the recurrence further into the future and pe keep people feeling well. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Nurse Herzdorfer, for having me. Uh, some of the people I work with. And of, and of course, and of course, all the patients uh, who really this is the whole point we're doing this for. Thanks.